Um, it's now my great honor to introduce today's second speaker, Dr. Yan He, um, who um, completed his bachelor in chemical engineering in Beijing and then moved to Northwestern to conduct his PhD under the supervision of Ishwa Radikar Rashnan, studying the mammalian SIN3 co repressor complex. Um, from there, he moved to Berkeley for his postdoc with Eva Nagalis, where he made some really cool discoveries regarding the structure of the pre-initiation complex. Um, then in 2015, he returned uh, to start his own group as assistant professor at Northwestern, where he has continued to push the envelope in understanding transcription, DNA repair, and chromatin enzymes. I'm, I'm really excited uh, for Dr. Yu's seminar today um, on the structural visualization of chromatin regulatory complexes using cryo-EM. So please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to today's second speaker, Dr. Yan He. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, uh, yes, we can see it. Uh, with the, just uh, the presenter uh, slide, right? Yes, I just see your title slide right now. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ben, for your kind introduction and thank uh, uh, Hanika, Kristen, and the rest of the uh, Fragile Nucleosome team for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm a big fan of your seminar series and I've been following you guys uh, uh, pretty much every single uh, seminar. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful. Um, so today um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, our work uh, since I joined Northwestern, uh, I think six years ago. Um, okay, how can I advance slide? Okay, um, I'm going to break my, uh, uh, my, my talk into three mini stories. Um, the first story has been presented at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting, so I'm going to go through that quickly um, um, for people that maybe have not attended that meeting. And then I'm going to uh, that's on the basal machinery of POL2 initiation complex. Um, and then I'm going to talk very briefly on uh, a, a work that uh, on our uh, structural visualization of chromatin remodeling complex, and then followed by um, our effort on, on understanding how double strand break is repaired. Uh, in this case, uh, on a more uh, naked DNA base, but uh, we're hoping to actually expand into uh, a chromatin context. Uh, how does these repair being taken care of? Um, so first, um, we're going to focus on the basal machinery. Um, so besides the, the pre-initiation complex depicting here, 44 pelvic peptide, um, we're very interested in studying uh, transcriptional uh, regulators, uh, which play a critical role during gene activation. Uh, many of these are made up of uh, functional distinct multi-subunit complexes including those called uh, modifiers and remodelers. Um, I guess here, uh, uh, can I actually, do you see my, oh, whoops. Um, actually, okay. Um, I don't think I can activate my mouse, but um, anyway. Um, so POL2 cannot by itself locate transcription start site, open a transcription bubble to, uh, to search for the start site um, and transition into an elongation mode. But instead, DNA bound transcription factors position the co-activator mediator uh, complex to facilitate the assembly of the pre-initiation complex. From our recent uh, Cold Spring Harbor meeting, there seems to be some exceptions, but uh, overall, I think uh, that uh, over, uh, in a big majority of the case, mediator playing a big role uh, in transcription initiation. So um, the entire uh, mediator complex is uh, over uh, almost three megadolphin in size containing 56 subunit in human. Um, while I was a postdoc in uh, Ava's lab, um, I developed this uh, in vitro reconstituting system to allow us to uh, visualize uh, in a stepwise manner, how does these uh, GTFs uh, uh, recognize DNA sequence and recruit POL2 to assemble the uh, simplified PIC. In this case, uh, TF2D uh, is replaced with TBP. So uh, when I start my own group here in Northwestern, 
um, we're quite naive thinking that maybe what we need to do is just add mediator um, somewhere in this pathway of uh, assembly, we will be able to uh, stabilize the interaction between mediator and the PIC um, and then determine the structure. Um, and by the way, um, uh, here we're just using a super core for motor developed uh, by Jim Kadanaga's group. Um, to our surprise, um, no matter where we actually add the mediator to this uh, very successful stepwise assembly protocol that we developed, um, we cannot detect consistently um, there's a, a, even a, a small population of mediator in association with the PIC. So shown here is uh, a, a representative micrograph of negative staining EM. Uh, I'm not going to go to the detail of uh, introducing the technique. I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, my former lab mate uh, Vignesh has done a fantastic job introducing this technique uh, along with other uh, presenters, speakers from this series. Um, and then shown on the right is 2D classification. Those little dots are coming from averaging multiple particles. And in most cases, we can only see you know, the core PIC without TF2H or with TF2H uh, based on the shape and uh, the size of the, uh, the 2D classification result. We cannot detect any mediator binding. So um, a very telling graduate student in the lab, uh, actually just joined the lab before even passed her call, uh, came up with this protocol um, uh, by reading a lot of literatures based on previous studies in the field, uh, including uh, studies from uh, Roger Kornberg's lab, Patrick Kramer's lab, uh, Steve uh, Bertalski's lab, came up with this protocol of uh, grouping these uh, general transmit factors and Pol2 into different uh, bins and pre-incubation before combining all of them together. Uh, that really helped us to uh, be able to um, uh, getting a consistent protocol to assemble this large complex. Um, I forgot to mention that in this case, we took a slightly different approach compared to um, the other labs that recently were able to come to similar conclusions of determining this large complex structure, including Petro Kramer's lab and uh, Yang Huishu's lab and Francisco Austria's lab, um, is that um, for Pol2 and Mediator and TF2H, um, uh, through a collaboration with Robert Tijin's lab at UC Berkeley, we purify the endogenous complex from uh, hundreds of liters of HeLa cells. So that's a, 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 a huge effort uh, from our collaborator and uh, uh, people in my lab point of view. Um, nevertheless, um, after following a similar protocol, um, Anna was be able to show uh, using the old protocol, the stepwise assembly, it's very homogeneous, uh, small particle corresponding to the core PIC without TF2H, whereas on the right is using this new protocol. Using similar amount of material, uh, the shape of the, uh, the, uh, the particle, even at uh, the raw micrograph level, start to uh, behave very differently. And from 2D classification, as you can see, it's still a very mixed population. And that's actually uh, one of the unique advantage of CryoEM for uh, for structural biology determination is to be able to handle these uh, very heterogeneous uh, sample very successfully. In this case, we estimate at most 15% of the sample particle contains uh, all the protein that we're, we're, we're targeting here. Um, so those in red boxes uh, depicting here are uh, likely corresponding to particles containing the PIC, the 2H, and mediator. Uh, whereas the yellow and orange are intermediate. Um, it's very hard to get rid of, complete get rid of all those and uh, using our pipeline of assembling the complex. Um, so after uh, a large amount of data collection at uh, PNCC, one of the national facility here supported by NIH, um, we were able to come down to a group of particle at 150,000 uh, that eventually we determined contain everything and uh, contribute to the structural determination. And shown here is a uh, animation uh, that contains uh, seven overlapping local refined density maps together. Uh, because the, the complex actually is very flexible and we have to uh, use a divine and conquer method to, uh, to 
to merge uh, these different regions together to be able to improve the resolution to allow us to build models. The resolution of these different parts ranging from 3.4 angstrom to 7 angstrom. Uh, as you can see, the highest resolution is the, the, the core PIC part, including the plumeries, as well as the tail and the head module of the mediator, whereas TF2H and the middle and uh, the CAC module is at close to 6-7 angstrom resolution. Um, the human mediator is held together by a central scaffold subunit, the MAT-14, which is colored in yellow, uh, which form uh, multiple contact sites with different modules, uh, with the tail, with the middle. And the precise orientation of the CAC module within this complex is also revealed for the first time uh, with clear density of uh, PO2 CCD in the active site, which I'm going to get to uh, briefly uh, in a few slides. Even though the CAC module is purified together with TF2H, um, as you can see, um, likely due to the MAT1 tightly engaging both the core and the CAC module of TF2H, uh, which is colored in magenta. Uh, once it's in incorporated into the PIC, CAC is almost becoming a, uh, a, a intimately uh, a, 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 a part of the mediator. So that will really facilitate positioning the, its active site um, uh, compare, uh, relative to the PAL2 CTD. Um, the location of mediator domains, um, I'm going to just briefly uh, summarize uh, the, the, some of the conclusions uh, we were able to draw from the structural work. Um, the locations of the domains of subunits that interact with these uh, activators throughout decades of work uh, from many labs um, has indicated that um, these flexibly tethered domains um, are involved in uh, this so-called fuzzy interactions that has been uh, defined by many labs, including uh, uh, Steve Hun uh, and others. Um, almost all domains are bound by uh, uh, domains uh, uh, by transcription factor in the mediator. Uh, including the N-terminus of the MAT-15, the N-terminus of MAT-25, C-terminus of MAT-1, those are all flexibly tethered to the main body and not visible in our reconstruction. Um, the precise orientation uh, of the CAC uh, allow us to very comfortably, uh, confidently um, model in uh, two pieces of CTD density into our uh, model. One is located uh, in panel A here, directly at the active site uh, of CDK7. Um, by comparing with a previously published crystal structure of CDK2, uh, we very confidently assign side chains, even though the resolution is not good enough here, but through homology model, bot modeling, we were able to model in and very consistently with the previous uh, published crystal structure, um, nicely representing how this uh, CTD, uh, uh, one part of the CTD from the endogenous um, uh, pol 2 uh, purified from HeLa cells, being able to recognize by the uh, CAC uh, in this giant complex. Um, and consistent from previous crystal structure in uh, Roger Kornberg's lab, we were also able to identify a piece of density corresponding to CTD that is playing a critical role in stabilizing the mediator complex uh, by interacting with different modules of the mediator shown in D and E. And um, eventually we came up with uh, uh, two possible scenario for the phosphorylation of CCD in the context of this large complex. Uh, one possibility is that um, to be able to facilitate the progressive phosphorylation of CTD of O2 by this complex, um, CTD can phosphorylate in an N to C terminus uh, direction, um, um, and that will um, uh, uh, indicate that the C terminus of the phosphorylated repeat um, not be able to bind at the CTD uh, that the part that we identify interact with the mediator due to steric clash. Whereas in the scenario that if it's a C to N termini direction, uh, that that part of the, uh, uh, the binding interface uh, between CTD and the mediator. Um, uh, it's not clear how PO2 would dissociate from mediator, uh, given that the CTD is threaded through this hole. 
uh, formed by the hook, knob, and the shoulder domain and the CAC module of the TF2H. Okay, so I would like to transition into um, uh, the chromatin remodeling complex. Uh, next, I'm going to just use uh, a three or four slides just to quickly illustrate uh, what this technique is capable to uh, imaging these large and very dynamic complexes sitting in this intricate network of regulation of, gene, uh, of transcription initiation. Um, so, oh, I don't think I can get rid of the voice. Okay, so due to the voice, uh, I'm going to switch to the next slide. Uh, you, from the video, you can actually already get a sense. How does the ATPase that incorporate into a large complex of uh, remodeler could do its work? Uh, essentially what it's trying to accomplish is to, uh, upon uh, consuming ATP hydrolysis, the energy from ATP hydrolysis, you will allow to introduce a, a uh, um, uh, intermediate state to allow the, uh, the, uh, the rotation of the DNA relative to the histone octamer. So at the time when we start this project, um, uh, th there are a lot of structural information already available for other families of remodelers, including in the 80, uh, um, uh, ICE we, uh, CHD1, uh, those type of remodeler, but for the switch sniff fan family, there's no structural information. So a, talent, a talented uh, postdoc in the lab, uh, Dr. Yan Han, um, by the way, who contributes to uh, also other uh, work that I don't have time to cover today on pole one and pole three initiation complex, um, came up with this strategy of uh, stabilizing um, the switch sniff remodeler, uh, purify endogenous from uh, Cervicier, uh, through a standard tap purification uh, with uh, the pipeline that I developed in Avis lab. Uh, but in this case, instead of using a restraining enzyme to elute the sample complex from a magnetic strap tap encoded be bead, um, we took advantage of a RNSH site. Uh, basically, it's an RNA DNA hybrid at one end of the reconstituted nucleosome that has an overhand DNA. Um, and then through RNSH elution, we'll be able to uh, elute the complex. Um, so shown here is a density map uh, of the switch, uh, East switch sniff in association with the remodeler. Uh, due to the time, I'm going to just skip, you know, the basics is published, uh, but just draw uh, uh, two findings. One is we were able to map the invariant residues uh, through uh, the cancer patient uh, database uh, to identify um, mutations that onto uh, various subunits. In this case, shown here is a uh, SNF2 subunit of the switch SNF uh, complex. Uh, some, some of them are actually located at interfaces that play a role in really uh, uh, recruiting or assembling the SNF2 subunit into the core of the complex. Uh, whereas other mutations heavily located at its interface with the nucleosome DNA, which is quite interesting. And another uh, piece of information we gathered from this reconstruction is that we were able to identify the subunit and the residues that involved in immobilizing the histone octamer uh, during this uh, active ATP dependent translocation of the DNA relative to the uh, uh, the proteins, so that it will allow the threading of the DNA and exposing um, uh, the plus uh, the, the the promoter upstream DNA to facilitate assembly of the the PIC. Okay, so um, I'm going to transition. Use the last few minutes to uh, talk about the third uh, small story that we also recently published. Uh, this is uh, on the topic of double strand break repair. Uh, there are two major pathways, along with other alternative uh, NHJ pathways, involved in repair this very toxic, toxic uh, DNA damage. Um, so unrepaired double strand break can um, drive ap apoptosis or senescence, and incorrect double strand break repair is a major contributor to uh, tumor genesis because it could potentially lead to 
undesired genome rearrangements, such as deletions, translocations, and fusions. Um, the two pathway, major pathway depicted here are homos recombination and NHEJ, now helps end joining. Um, and there are similarities and, of course, major differences between these two pathways. Uh, NHEJ is the one that really uh, playing a dominant role in uh, mammalian cells, especially human cells, uh, because it, it's the only pathway that is functioned throughout the cell cycle, whereas homos recombination really depends on a, uh, um, a cystic chromatin that is becoming available for uh, repairing uh, in an um, uh, error-free manner. So um, we already, uh, from a st structural point of view, we already know uh, how does this process start. So it starts with a KU7080 uh, heterodimer, recognize double strand break in a very efficient way. It has a very uh, a high concentration in the cell, especially human, for Q80 and Q, uh, Q70 and 80, um, that will uh, have an nanomolar affinity with a double strand break. That recruits uh, a large PI3K family member kinase called DNA PKCS, uh, the catalytic subunit of the protein kinase that recognized by double strand break. That form a complex that protect the DNA end from further processing. And this system actually uh, is remind us about similarities of, uh, of different types of PI3K family members dealing with the double strand break at different stages of the cell cycle. For instance, uh, replication involved in, uh, involving ATR, ATRIP with RPA coded single strand DNA. Whereas uh, if NHEJ doesn't work, HR could potentially uh, take over to repair uh, double strand break through a resection mechanism and that initiate with uh, the help of ATM and MRN uh, resection machinery. So what we're hoping to achieve through this structural uh, uh, approach is to uh, elute uh, potential evolutionary conserved mechanism to uh, learn how does PI3K family kinases uh, deal with a double strand break and cope with different effector molecules to repair the DNA damage. Um, structurally, there's already a lot of information uh, that we already know about the factors, key factors uh, that is evolutionally conserved playing the role in assembling the complex. Uh, there are two tasks for uh, uh, the initiation uh, complex. It's recognizing the double strand break, but also gather these um, repair factor together to facilitate the synapse of the two breaking ends. Um, Single, particle, single molecule studies uh, recently done uh, from um, uh, Lapora's lab at Harvard have given us some clue uh, what could potentially happen in this process. Uh, they were able to use a single molecule FRAT to identify two distinct state in the repair uh, of double strand break through NHEJ. They have identified a low FRAT state and a high FRAT state. Um, they call it long range versus short range complex. In the long range complex, the DNA are hold in proximity, but not next to each other that is compatible with the ligation. Whereas in the short range complex, um, it's indistinguishable from uh, the double strand break, uh, double strand break that has been repaired by uh, ligase four. So uh, a graduate student in the lab was able to um, first capture a long range complex. In this case, um, it, we were able to identify two copies of DNA PKCS, two copies of DNA uh, Q7080 heterodimer, and two copies of uh, XRCC4, uh, ligase 4, as well as one copy of uh, XLF. Um, and from this complex, um, as you can see, the two DNA are actually held in close proximity, but not in the uh, a manner that is compatible with ligation. It's actually well protected. Um, and this is likely the long range complex. And through biochemical reconstitution, we were able to uh, recapitulate uh, what could potentially happen. And consistent with the previous studies, um, a autophosphorylation of DNA PKCS upon ATP addition is required for a transition from the long range to the short range in which uh, the complex, the protein is capable to recognize the double strand break, put the, uh, fuse the two DNA together. Um, 
And um, structurally, we were also able to capture this uh, by bypassing the uh, incorporation of the DNA-PKCS, uh, which is also consistent with the biochemistry, uh, the ligation assay we developed. Um, we still don't know uh, what's the major reason, what's the major role of DNA-PKCS in, in this role, uh, but hopefully uh, in the next slide, you, you will at least get an idea one of the role could potentially be played by DNA-PKCS. Uh, but in this case, we can see the full DNA uh, in the more or less uh, b form DNA in the middle that is stabilized by single ligase four calic domain. There's another calic domain ligase four from the opposite end of this complex uh, that is flexible uh, presumably uh, involved in uh, dealing with the double strand break. So in this case, you have two ligase four and you have two NIC to seal. And what we're proposing based on our study, because this complex is not symmetric upon conformational change uh, and the sealing with one NIC, the second ligase four calic domain will be able to recognize the second NIC and then seal the, uh, uh, to, to wrap up the double strand break repair. By comparing the two state uh, between the long range and the short range, we start to realize one of the role of DNA-PKCS could potentially be um, helping to position the Ku molecule, which is initially uh, binding to the very end of the double strand break uh, to allow the seamless transition from the long range to the short range. Be besides its protection role, because here you can see it's very protective once DNA-PKC has undergone uh, phosphorylation, uh, autophosphorylation, um, it will actually facilitate this transition um, that you know, uh, leaves the Ku on the DNA, whereas the flexible uh, ligase 4 calic domain would be able to recognize um, the NIC that is being exposed in the middle. Um, with that, I would like to thank uh, again people in my lab uh, our collaborators, I think I have mentioned most name uh, throughout the talk, Ryan and Anna contribute to, equally to the mediator PIC story. Yen uh, contribute to the uh, switch sniff remodeler story. Um, and then Su Yu contribute to the uh, NHJ story. And our collaborators, including um, uh, Susan Lisa Miller, Alan Tompkinson for the NHJ and Robert Tijin on the mediator PIC. And thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. That was that was beautiful. Just incredible work. Um, so we've got a couple I, I questions actually, coming actually, in. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot. Um, kind of a shameless advertisement. We're looking for postdocs. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, we you know you don't necessarily have to have cryo EM or any structural biology background. We're actually um, you know if you're interested in incorporate cryo EM into your tool toolbox, this is a great greatest time. Um, Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that was that was incredible. Um, I've got a naive question to start off with, um, and then we've got a few coming in in the Q and A. I thought it was really interesting in your mediator pick structure that even though you use the BP sixteen to purify it, yes, um, you still couldn't see it in the structure because it was presumably yes. too flexible. Yes. And I was one. This is the naive part, but I wonder if if you had the DNA binding motif on your DNA template, like a little bit further upstream, what do you think might happen? Um, it's going to be still very flexible um, because DNA along with the activation DNA binding domain, say a GAL4, it's mm -hmm. uh, that size compared to the humongous size of the media PIC is going to be not com be comparable. Um, but nevertheless, we are in the process of trying to go after that uh, potentially activator enhancer binding uh, bound form of the, uh, of the complex. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then we've got a question from Gregory Bowman, who says, beautiful data and talk. Um, could you comment on any key similarities and differences between the SWISNF nucleosome complex and the recent RISC nucleosome structures? Um, yes. Um, I don't think I have that slide in terms of comparison. Um, but the, the two complex belong to the same family. Um, due to some shared subunits and architecture. Um, it engaged with the nucleosome in a very similar way at, uh, at a similar location compared to uh, some of the outlier in, in the NO80 family. Um, 
we are in the process of trying to um, uh, looking into the human version of the switch sieve family in collaboration with the Seagull Kadich lab uh, at Harvard uh, at the moment. Um, hopefully, uh, in a few years, we will be able to you know, reveal those. Um, but we will be very surprised to see much difference. I think that, you, that we do have an example between a comparison between East versus human, the switch sniff versus bath complex uh, published by uh, Yanhui Xu's lab. The same lab also uh, solved the TF2D, PIC, and mediator complex recently uh, published in Science. Um, I think there, architectural wise, BAF is almost the same as switch sniff, whereas uh, risk is likely going to, cause, uh, uh, going to you know, correspond to the PBAF complex. Um, the major question, I think, is how does these complex be recruited to uh, the chromatin? Uh, right now, there's all the structural studies don't reveal uh, much of those structural information in terms of the bromo domain interacting with uh, the, uh, the histone uh, tails and things like that. I think there's still a lot of work need to do. Um, and I think uh, the single molecule uh, technique is going to be critical in answer a lot of these questions in terms of comparing uh, different remodelers as well as um, how does activator um, potentially recruit these molecules, uh, in, uh, the, these remodeler onto the appropriate region of the chromatin. Awesome. Um, and I've got a question from Anir Bandas Gupta who says, wonderful structures. Um, the work on pinpointing swi sniff interaction with histone octamer sounds very interesting. Would it be a good idea to look into the interrelationships of swi sniff with other histone modifying enzymes like PRC2 to study chromatin dynamics? Um, yes, I think that's something that uh, this I, I want to learn from this audience is that um, right now, it seems like that picture is pretty vague in terms of the coming and goes of the event, what's, what's happening uh, for laying the foundation for the nucleosome free region to assemble the PIC. Um, does these things come and goes, or actually we're talking about a, another level of cooperation between modifiers, remodelers, and components of PIC, even including the plus one nucleosome to facilitate, because as we know, if you deplete uh, yeah. remodelers, um, it has a huge impact on the nucleosome free region as well as plus one nucleosome. So unless there's some kind of a tug wall between remodeler modifier and components of the PIC to really stabilize transient states, um, I guess the chromatin is always going to win. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. We're actually trying to develop technologies to be able to allow us to um, visualize um, a larger uh, uh, crosstalk between these machines. All right, and then one last question uh, for anonymous attendee who says, great work, did you observe promoter opening in any of your classes containing the PIC mediator complex? Um, yeah, um, we... we we intentionally leave out ATP in this case. Um, I think there are great work that has been accomplished recently from Patrick Kramer's lab and others um, that being able to depicting that, you know, very transient state, that's beautiful work. In our case, we, we have not tried adding ATP into the mixer because we feel like we're already dealing with a very heterogeneous population of particles and, um, we, we don't know what will happen, you know, and it's also a very short DNA without chromatin in the context. So we feel um, it's premature to, to, to draw any conclusion uh, based on that. But definitely that's something that we're interested to pursue. That's it. Okay, um, with that, we'll, we're out of time. So we're gonna close up the seminar portion of, the, of today's um, series. So, Thank you, Jan and Hanukkah, both for your talks. Um, it was incredible. Um, and now we're going to transition to the coffee chat.